So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. Um, my name is Jake Shermeyer. I'm a research scientist with Cosmic Works, and uh, joining me today to present this as well is Daniel Hogan. I'm a data um, scientist with Cosmic Works. Uh, today we're going to be talking about SpaceNet and specifically the SpaceNet Ch Six Challenge. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, generally what SpaceNet is. If you're not familiar with SpaceNet, uh, we're going to talk about the challenge structure. Uh, we're going to go over what the data set is, and also we're going to be talking about our algorithmic baseline that we we built for this challenge. Um, so if you're not familiar with what SpaceNet is. Uh, SpaceNet is a non-profit LLC managed by Cosmic Works. Um, it's dedicated to accelerating open source artificial intelligence applied research for geospatial applications, specifically geared towards foundational mapping. Um, our present partners are uh, Cosmic, Maxar, AWS, Intel AI, uh, Capella Space, Topcoder, IEEE GRSS, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and Planet Labs are, is our, our newest partner uh, for 2020 and 2021. Um, SpaceNet is really about uh, four specific pillars. Uh, we curate high quality labeled data sets. In this case, it's uh, all satellite or aerial imagery. Um, thus far, we have 11 cities in the full data set, over 900,000 building footprint labels, and 20,000 kilometers of, of road labels. And this encompasses over 26,000 square kilometers of, of satellite imagery. Um, and I should mention that all of this data is, is open source. Uh, it's made available through the AWS Open Data Program. Uh, so you can go and, and download this data today and we'll, we'll share a little bit, bit about how you can do that um, near the end of this presentation. Um, thus far, we've had five challenges hosted on Topcoder and have awarded $250,000 in, in total prizes. Uh, today we'll be discussing the sixth challenge, uh, which actually just concluded on Topcoder. We're entering into the final scoring stage here. Uh, and we've had over 1,300 submissions worldwide. That number has actually more than doubled uh, since SpaceNet 6. So um, that's ma making real progress. Uh, the challenges really attract some of the highest quality uh, participants and uh, so some of the best data scientists in the world who are who actually compete in these challenges. So, so we've seen real, real success with this format. Uh, beyond the challenges, we also open source uh, several algorithms. So, so the main outputs from these challenges are algorithms that uh, these data scientists create. Uh, 13 of which we have open source are geared towards building detection, and another 10 are focused on road detection and routing. Uh, Finally, um, our fourth pillar is evaluation. So this is really uh, how to best benchmark performance for, for multiple tasks, whether you're interested in uh, the best way to extract building footprints, uh, how do you evaluate such things, or road network extraction. We, we also have metrics that we've built ge geared towards that. Um, finalize, finally, we have also have a very active blog that features a detailed analysis on a lot of the challenges as well as the data sets uh, that, that you can read. And we'll, we'll share the links for that uh, down the road here in the slides. Um, so our, our open data sets, the, the SpaceNet data sets, really we, we focus on um, four more pillars here. So we're, we're really focused on, on quality. Most of all, we, we want to ensure that the label quality is really the, the best and, and the highest that we can get. Um, goes through several quality control rounds. We have structured taxonomies that we, we create prior to creating these, these labels. Um, and they're, they're rigor rigorously reviewed and tested by us before, before we actually release them. Um, the availability of open data is also critical. And uh, licensing, more particularly, is uh, really something that, that's often overlooked but is absolutely essential for broad market uh, ad adoption. So we, we open source everything under a Creative Commons attribution share like 4.0. This means not just academic researchers, but also corporate entities can download and use our data, which um, we're, we're super excited about to make it available to everyone that uh, you, know, you can build both research and, and products on top of the SpaceNet data sets. Uh, third, thirdly, uh, accessibility. Um, the open data set must remain open after 
uh, our specific events, so in this case, our challenges, and that it must be easily accessible in the cloud. And this is why we host it through the AWS Open Data Program. Uh, there is no request or pays. Um, so basically the data set is, is freely available. You can download terabytes of data for free to, to your hard drives today uh, at no cost to you. All you have to do is open up an AWS account to do this. Um, and we, we have guides uh, as to how to do that if you're, you're not familiar with this. Uh, our final uh, piece here is interoperability. Uh, specifically, this is going to be cloud optimized GeoTIFFs. So uh, creating uh, our data and making the data be able to be displayed in a cloud optimized format. So you can load it in a web browser, uh, basically share it, uh, build web-based mapping applications. Uh, that, that's that's a, a crucial piece. The spatial temporal asset catalog is another one, so standardized metadata, so people actually know what the data is, what's contained in it. And again, this, this just increases interoperability and transferability to, to new, new places and new people. Um, and finally, uh, the last two pieces here are, uh, I touched on a little bit already was the standardized labeling taxonomy, so re really ensuring that things are standardized in a, a consistent format. Um, and more specifically, having clear evaluation metrics. So uh, your IOU thresholds are Apple's metrics, uh, some of the more technical things that, that we've, we've worked to build and uh, curate. So I'll turn it over to Daniel to walk you through um, our, our cities and some of the other pieces of the, the SpaceNet offerings. Over the course of the six SpaceNet challenges, a variety of data has been open sourced. And that includes uh, 11 different cities from five continents and showing a great range of geographic diversity. For each of these cities, we've open sourced high resolution electro optical data. In the case of the Atlanta USA data set, the data also includes views from many different off-nader viewing angles, all taken within a few minutes of each other. And in the case of the Rotterdam data set, we have our first multimodal data set, including not just high-resolution electro-optical data, but also high-resolution synthetic aperture radar data. We take these large 16-bit geotiffs and tile them down to smaller sizes for competitions, for ease of use, typically 200 meters on a side. The imagery, however, is only half the story. The other half is high quality labels. And for many of the cities, specifically eight, we have building footprint labels available, which together total 900,000 buildings. For nine of the cities, we have road network labels available which altogether comprise 20,000 kilometers of roads. Next slide, please. Central to how we approach SpaceNet is the systematic way in which these challenges are designed. So each challenge is more ambitious than the ones that came before it. But at the same time, each challenge refers back to the ones that came before it so that the lessons learned can be drawn forward to help solve new problems. The first SpaceNet challenge, which began in late 2016, asked challenge participants to find building footprints in overhead electro-optical imagery of Rio de Janeiro. The second SpaceNet challenge had the same task, but brought geographic diversity into the mix with four different cities from four different continents. SpaceNet 3 looked at extracting a completely different kind of information from the imagery. Instead of buildings, looking for the network of roads. And in the course of doing so, SpaceNet 3 introduced a new algorithm for evaluating the performance of road network extraction, which has proven to be quite useful. Space 4, SpaceNet 4 returned to the issue of building footprints, but brought it into a more real world situation where imagery isn't always from exactly overhead. It is often from a very off nader viewing angle, which makes for a more challenging problem. Addressing that was the focus of SpaceNet 4. And SpaceNet 5 
revisited road network extraction, but brought it into a more realistic, real-world scenario by asking challenge participants to not only extract the road network, but also extract reasonable travel speeds on each segment of road, which is the missing link needed to estimate the actual optimal travel routes and travel times and other kinds of real world things that one would want to know about a road network. And finally, SpaceNet 6, which is now coming to its conclusion, brought multimodal data to SpaceNet with a unique data set of electro-optical imagery combined with synthetic aperture radar. Next slide, please. Over the years, interest in the SpaceNet data releases has only grown. In that time, there have been 530 million hits to the public data repositories, resulting in 678 terabytes of total downloads. We've open sourced 23 algorithms, the best of the best, out of 3,089 challenge submissions over the course of the six SpaceNet six excuse me, over the course of the six SpaceNet challenges. During this time, we've seen requests for data downloads coming from 82 different countries. Next slide, please. So that's SpaceNet in general. For a look at SpaceNet 6 specifically, I'll turn it back over to Jake. All right, thanks, Daniel. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more here about the, the challenge structure. Um, so. Our challenge here is uh, a multi-sensor all-weather mapping one. And, and why do we call it multi-sensor all-weather mapping? Uh, really, that, that goes to uh, the SAR or synthetic aperture radar component of, of the data set. Um, if you're not familiar with SAR, SAR can actually uh, penetrate clouds. It can work in all illumination settings, so both day and night. Uh, and the reason for this is it's uh, just an active sensor. So it's actually shooting a beam at the ground, which is then reflected off the surface, and it comes back to the, to the sensor. Um, and SAR data really has been uh, underexploited and uh, underexplored, particularly in uh, the computer vision world or, or the AI research setting. And the reason for this is just a, a lack of open data that, that's available. Um, so that, that was our primary motivation for creating this data set. Uh, the data set is centered over Rotterdam, the Netherlands, which is the largest port in Europe. Uh, it's over 120 square kilometers of data we've captured. We have near simultaneous collects of both SAR data as well as electro-optical data. So if you're not familiar with EO, that's just kind of how, how our eyes see and a little bit beyond into further wavelengths. Um, and what I mean by near simultaneous is it's within a few days of each other. We're not talking within in minutes. Uh, but but rather days, which is is totally okay for something an application like building footprint mapping. Um, our labels in this sense, uh, what we're interested in mapping is going to be forty eight thousand building footprints. So we're going to uh, our our competitors, our participants were were asked to build AI algorithms that could automatically extract extract building footprint labels uh, using mostly SAR data, uh, but with the, the choice to augment with, with EO as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the, our, our two primary challenge goals, uh, we really wanted to baseline the performance of AI algorithms to detect buildings in SAR imagery. So as, as I said, not a lot of SAR data out there. We're not really sure how well these will do in, in this case. Um, and the, the second goal was to test if EO data can be used to augment or improve SAR imagery in any way. And I'll, I'll talk about how we structured the competition to really uh, incentivize that. So th this is the SpaceNet 6 timeline. So we released the data uh, on, in early February, February 10th. Um, so as I said, you can download that today via a AWS. Um, the, the challenge started uh, on March 16th. We released uh, an algorithmic baseline. So basically starter code that Daniel created uh, to help our participants get, get started and, and spun up on, on this challenging problem. Uh, from there, the uh, challenge ran the whole way until May 1st, and um, right now is uh, the end of May, and we are finalizing our, our scores, uh, getting the final leaderboard set, and then we will be awarding prizes and announcing our winners on June 4th. Um, the uh, 
total prize structure here is uh, we, we had fifty thousand dollars in in cash prizes, so twenty thousand went to first place with uh, two thousand five hundred. Going down to to fifth, uh, we also give out fifteen thousand dollars in AWS GPU compute credits for participants. So, if they make, meet a certain benchmark, uh, we then award uh, a five hundred dollar credit for them to to spin up their models and and do do some some training that way. Uh, our challenge ultimately will conclude on June fourteenth at CBPR Earth Vision, which is a, a workshop associated with uh, the Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference. And uh, this is one of the uh, leading AI computer vision conferences in, in the world. Um, so we're, we're really excited to be, be included here. Uh, we will uh, be sharing some of the results of the challenge and just talking more about the, the data set and uh, also having some of our, our, our winning participants sh share kind of what worked for them and what was novel. Uh, about their solutions. Uh, we also have a paper uh, about the data set. So if you want to go deep, you can you can read uh, quite a bit about the SpaceNet 6 data set um, through the uh, Earth Vision proceedings. Um, and then just to talk about the the data set overview. So more specifically, what 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 is uh, in this data set and why is it structured in such a way and um, why why should you care? Basically, um, the uh, the SAR data here is uh, provided from Capella Space. So Capella is uh, one of our newest SpaceNet partners. Uh, they're, they're a startup. They will be launching their first sensor very soon in, into orbit. Um, but this is actually a test collection from from Capella. Um, so they've mounted one of their sensors, a, a very similar sensor at least, to what they'll be launching to, to space and then uh, wanted to, to test the capabilities uh, of that sensor uh, before you actually get it into space. Um, so th this is comes from an aerial collect. So an airplane is actually flying the, these image strips um, and the collection dates uh, span uh, a small portion of August here. So August 4th, 23rd and 24th of 2019, 204 image strips in total. And if you look, check out the, the graphic on your right here, which has been, been spinning through. Uh, the, the background of this graphic is our electrical optical data uh, from the Worldview 2 satellite from Maxar. The SAR data comes from this, this Capella Aerial Collect, and these are these individual image strips that are, are being collected. Uh, so this is just kind of one pass of uh, the aerial flight, and the, these are the literal flight lines as they happen. Uh, sped up quite a bit, obviously, but um, this is, I believe, for, from the August 4th collection. Um, so the uh, details of of this data set, it's it's quad polarized. So for for your star you star fanatics out there, that means we have all, all four polarizations. So uh, that's that's the maximum you, you can have. Uh, basically, it, this is how the uh, the wave is uh, distributed from from the sensor and returns how it's uh, spun and polarized. Uh, the spatial resolution here, in the raw sense, is uh, 0.25 meters. We distribute the data at half a meter after some some uh, pre-processing. Uh, the alternator look angle in this sense is 55 to 57 degrees, which is uh, pretty standard of of SAR collects. Um, so if you're curious about how we, we build this data set uh, a little bit more, um, some of the pre-processing that we do to, to really get it into a challenge ready format here, uh, we have uh, uh, we work with the SLC data, we align and co-register all four of the polarizations and then do some fine, fine code registration really to ensure that things are closely georeferenced to the earth as well as they can be and that all four polarizations align as they're supposed to. Um, we calculate the amplitude of, of the SAR data and then square to get intensity. And then we perform a, a multi-looking algorithm, which is basically a noise reduction step um, with an average convolution in the two by two, two kernel. Uh, from there, we convert the polarization intensity to decibels. So this is just a unit conversion. And then we georegister and ortho rectify and save the, the quad polarizations uh, into a four channel image at ha half meter resolution. And uh, the image on the right here, we have, uh, so you can see uh, some, some of the SAR data. So this is a mosaic of some of the, the image strips. Uh, and you can see it's, re it's really beautiful data. Um, the building footprints here are outlined in red. 
So a lot of different activity here in Rotterdam beyond the building footprints. You can see the, the oil tanks, uh, some ships. Um, interesting thing about SAR imagery is how uh, taller objects will bounce back and appear closer to the, the sensor. Uh, so you can see some of that happening on, on the right side of the image with that boat, the, the top of the mass actually start to lean back towards where, where the sensor is, um, appearing that they're, they're actually closer to the sensor, which is a interesting phenomenon of, of SAR data. Um, so our, the second piece of our data set here is the electro optical imagery. Uh, our collection date here is from uh, August 31st. So again, this is about a, a week after the, the last image was collected uh, of SAR. Uh, we've got Worldview 2 imagery in this case, uh, which is uh, pre-processed in our, our standard format that we've done for all of our past challenges. So this is atmospheric correction, to surface reflectance units, then ortho rectification. So again, we're making sure that the the terrain is accounted for when we're doing all of our georeferencing here. Um, we've got four channels of imagery in this case, so red, green, blue, and near infrared. Uh, again, this is half meter, so it, it's the, the same resolution as, as our SAR. SAR data, the uh, base resolution of this before pan sharpening is, is two meter data. We also distribute that, and our off nader looking here is 18.44 degrees. Um, and then just to talk about our, our annotations, we worked with the 3D bag data set from August of 2019 also. So this data set is actually curated by the Netherlands Cadastre. So this is their land registry and mapping agency. It spans the entirety of, of the Netherlands in this case. Uh, and this data set actually, the 3D component of the, the 3D bag data set comes from um, a LIDAR collection. So each building actually has height estimates as well. Uh, so we didn't ask competitors to actually um, use this height data uh, or try to predict the height of buildings, but that's something that you certainly could do, and that's something we're going to investigate in some of our post-challenge analysis here. Um, ultimately, we come down to 48,000 48, buildings included in the final data set. Um, we do throw out areas that don't have uh, enough labels, uh, which happens uh, very occasionally. And we do also dissolve some, some building footprints together. So uh, in some senses, a lot of these buildings here might have row houses here. So they might, uh, individual addresses are actually represented in the, the raw data set. Uh, we end up merging those together to make sure that individual buildings uh, stay stay together in, in this case, uh, as it's just simply too challenging to map individual addresses from, from space at this point. Um, finally, we really do a lot, lot more pre-processing really to get this into a challenge-friendly format. Um, so we have uh, basically EO and SAR pairs for the for each location and we tile the data to 450 meters squared or 900 pixels on a side. Um, a lot of uh, current AI algorithms uh, need data that is tiled into smaller formats. You can't just feed in really super expansive satellite images in, into these algorithms and expect them to work. Um, it's really geared towards smaller images. So that, that's, that's why we do this. Um, so in, in a sense, we first tile the SAR data uh, and then we tile the EO data to match the extent of the SAR tile. Uh, and from there, we then, uh, the EO and building footprints are also masked to the extent of the SAR images. You notice these images are, are a bit rectangular here. And the reason for that is it's uh, clipped off on, on the side as sometimes the, the image strip uh, just isn't exactly square. So we wanna make sure we account for that. Uh, we then split the training data into three sets. So we have a training set, a testing set, and a scoring data set. So the training data set we distribute to all of the uh, to everyone, and that has both the um, all of the SAR, all of the EO data, as well as building footprints. Then we have a testing and scoring data set. We distribute the testing data set, and in this case, the testing data set actually only contains just the SAR data, no labels. Um, and then we set up a leaderboard through our, our challenge site, which is TopCoder. Participants will submit, uh, will have the imagery, run their models in the imagery, and then submit uh, proposal outputs to, to this leaderboard. Uh, and the leaderboard will then, then tell them whether the proposal is, is good, good or bad um, in a numeric format. And then finally, the, the algorithms will be scored once more on a final held back scoring data set 
uh, that they, they haven't seen before. And the reason we do this is to ensure that algorithms really can generalize well to, to new areas. Um, another uh, little niche uh, fact here about this data set is that the training data set contains both SAR and EO. However, the testing and scoring sets contain only SAR data. And the reason we did this is we really want to see how well algorithms can do just scoring on, on SAR data alone. However, um, there we also want to test if uh, having EO data and maybe doing some sort of pre-processing steps uh, to transform your SAR data to look more like EO data, to perhaps pre-train your models on, on the EO data first before switching to SAR, uh, to do some colorization, uh, other interesting techniques. Uh, we wanted to test it if that would really add any value. Um, and then, you know, in a, a real use case scenario, while you might have historical collections of EO and SAR in some locations, uh, but when you actually go into the field and you're, you're doing your work, you might only have um, SAR data. So can, can you use that historical EO data in a sense to, to pre-process and improve prove that SAR, SAR collect in, in some way? And that, that's why we structured it in this case, and we were hopeful that, that participants might be able to figure out a way to, to best use the, this EO data. Um, so for section four, I'll turn this back over to Daniel. Uh, he built our algorithmic baseline and he will walk you through what, what that means and what that entailed. At the beginning of each SpaceNet challenge, we release an algorithmic baseline. Next slide, please. The algorithmic baseline is a complete solution to the challenge problem. And the idea is to provide a starting point, either in terms of code or just ideas that challenge participants may elect to use as they begin to go off and develop their own solutions. So this slide shows some images of the baseline at work. The first two images are example optical and, and SAR imagery, as would both be available during training, as Jake noted. Then during testing, only the SAR is available. So the third image you see here shows the baseline algorithm's best attempt at extracting building footprints from just the SAR imagery. And comparing that to the ground truth building footprints in the fourth image, you can see that there's an overall correspondence, but also room for improvement. So one of the things that makes the baseline for SpaceNet 6 unique is that this is the first time our baseline is built off of Solaris, which is a open source Python library for geospatial deep learning that was recently introduced by Cosmic Works. And Solaris provides tools for the entire geospatial deep learning pipeline, which typically begins with tiling out large imagery files, taking vector labels and turning them into raster masks corresponding to those tiles, and then training a deep learning model and using it for inference. The inference output in the form of pixel masks can then be converted into vector uh, labels, which can then be evaluated using various standardized performance metrics. So all of these steps are made much easier than would otherwise be the case using the tools within Solaris, and uh, all of them have been used in the baseline. While we're on the topic of Solaris, part of what makes it so valuable is that it can be used to compare different models and other differences of approach. So for example, if you have two researchers both developing solutions or potential solutions to a geospatial problem, they might have different Python environments, different Python versions, different GDAL versions, deep different deep learning formats or frameworks or hardware types, and it makes an apples to apples comparison very difficult. But with Solaris, there's a uniform environment in which it's very easy to slot in and out different deep learning architectures, even comparing TensorFlow models to PyTorch models, and other kinds of changes, all specified in a simple configuration file 
which allows for faster prototyping and research and development of effective models to solve one's geospatial deep learning problem. Next slide, please. So that's Solaris, and what we built with it is uh, the deep is the baseline algorithm. The baseline here has at its heart a deep neural network, which has a unit architecture with a VGG11 encoder. The first half of this network combines information on progressively larger geographic scales to get a big picture understanding of what's going on. The second half of the model takes that information and propagates it back down to smaller scales, ultimately producing for each pixel a prediction of whether or not it is part of a building. And then from those pixel maps, vector outlines can be produced. Now, this is a standard technique in computer vision, but to work with SAR data, we had to take some of the unique features of SAR into account. One of those things is the geometric effects that make the directionality from which the imagery was taken important. Uh, Jake mentioned, for example, the layover distortion in the case of the ship's masts, which you see here in the image for uh, buildings next to the, the side, edge of the water. And so we took directionality into account. Another thing is we wanted to take advantage of the information in the optical data. And we did that with a transfer learning approach where the model was trained first on the optical data to learn the basics of extracting building footprints from overhead imagery. And then it was retrained on the SAR data to, to specialize in working with the kind of data where we wanted it to perform the best. To evaluate model performance, we use what we call the SpaceNet metric, which is an evaluation metric that has very elegant simplicity to it. The way it works is for every predicted building footprint, you define it as correct if it has an intersection over union with the ground truth building footprint of at least one half. And then you compute the F1 score for correct building footprints. The reason why this is a good metric to use is that it penalizes the right sorts of things. If the algorithm misses a building entirely, that's penalized pretty heavily. But if an algorithm just gets the exact location of the walls a little bit wrong, that's penalized lightly, if at all. And so the metric corresponds with our common sense conception of what it means to perform well on a task like this. So the baseline algorithm's performance by this metric uh, is 21, which is a number that doesn't mean anything in isolation, but to put it into some context, if we forego the transfer learning, then the score drops to only 14, indicating that there was value in that step. And it slides actually a little bit more if we ignore the directionality, which can be important for SAR. So there are many other ways that models like this could be improved. The most direct one is to play around with different model architectures and different hyperparameters trying to optimize performance. One could go at it from a domain adaptation angle, trying to convert a SAR problem into something more like an optical problem. And one could also look into the literature of SAR analysis algorithms extending back decades. So there are many ways to approach this problem. Looking at what challenge participants that have done is the next step. Next slide, please. And, and for right. that, I will hand it over to Jake. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so looking at our, our public leaderboard, this is where we sit as of May 1st. Uh, as I said, our winners will be announced on June 4th. So currently right now what we're doing is we're retraining uh, a subset of the, these, these top algorithms. And then from there, we will derive our final scoring on, on that, that final held back test set. Uh, so these scores will change a little bit. There will likely be some movement in uh, who moves up and who moves down. Uh, these are uh, right now where we're at. Uh, so you can see the, the baseline at, at the very bottom there. It's now currently in 53rd place after starting out as the, the top solution. And th this isn't a bad thing. This, this is a good thing. We put the baseline out. 
um, to see, you know, as a as an entry level, you know, first first crack at this problem. Uh, and you can see that people have really improved on, on that baseline since then, uh, more than than doubling it. Most of the top ten have doubled that score, um, which is really encouraging, showing a, a lot of progress, and it really shows the value of this challenge setting and, and crowdsourcing what's happening um, in, in this domain. Um, so look out for the the full winners announcement on on June fourth, um, and if you would like to. Uh, reach and deep dive deep into some of the other things we have. We, we have a ton of material out there. Um, I am Jake Shermeyer. I am the challenge manager. Uh, Daniel Hogan was our the, the second speaker. He was the, the baseline lead. Um, we also have several other contacts in, in other organizations. Ryan Lewis is our general manager of, of SpaceNet, and Jason Brown was the Capella Space lead and uh, the, the SAR providing company for, the, for this challenge. Um, so just to look at and check out some of these other information channels, if you're interested in seeing uh, or working with Solaris, that's right now on the Cosmic repo. So github.com slash cosmic. The SpaceNet repo uh, is also there, and that's where we have all of those winning algorithms. So if you're interested in building footprints or road network extraction or really any other geospatial problem, these could be great starting places for you, you to look at. Uh, some of the best techniques right now, um, state of the art for extracting building footprints or, or really any other mapping feature, you, you could extend these these to other problems. Um, if you want to learn more about SpaceNet, some of the historical challenges we've run or download our data set, you can go to spacenet.ai or check out the SpaceNet data on the open data program. Uh, we have an active blog, uh, CosmicWorks, uh, the downlink. So we talk about SpaceNet frequently there, as well as some other uh, geospatially relevant topics and, and research that, that we've done over the years. Uh, we also have a podcast, so if you enjoy hearing Daniel and myself speak, then you can certainly check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Uh, the title of the podcast is Training Underscore Data. Don't miss that underscore. And we're also on Twitter, so if you want to twit some tweets at us, uh, we're at space not that, SpaceNet underscore AI, Cosmic Works, Maxar, Intel AI, or AWS Cloud. Um, yeah, and that's that's our presentation for the day. We, we thank you for your attention and thanks for viewing.